April 1950, at the Baldwin Locomotive Works plant, a machine that looked as if it had stepped out of a science fiction film rolled out of the factory gates. Road number 4000, nickname Blue Goose, glossy blue paint, an aerodynamic body, no smokestack, no pounding pistons, only a quiet promise that the old era was about to end. It was a moment when America believed that technology could overcome any limitation. The war had just ended. Jet engines had conquered the skies, and gas turbines were transforming power plants. In the eyes of engineers, piston engines, whether steam or diesel, were beginning to look like mechanical relics, loud, vibrating, burdened with thousands of tired, reciprocating parts. And so the question emerged almost naturally. If a gas turbine could pull an airplane across an ocean, why couldn't it pull a train? To understand why this gas turbine project was once considered serious, one must look at the names standing behind it. Westinghouse Electric Corporation was no starry-eyed laboratory. As early as 1896, the company had mastered steam turbines for industrial power generation. During World War II, Westinghouse also entered the jet age with the J-30 engine, powering the U.S. Navy's FH-1 Phantom carrier-based fighter. Meanwhile, the American railroad industry stood at a historic crossroads. Steam locomotives had reached the end of their time. Maintenance costs were high, large crews were required, and they no longer fit the post-war economy. Diesel electric power was on the rise, but in 1950, it was not yet the undisputed winner. Individual locomotives produced only about 1,500 to 1,600 horsepower. To move heavy trains, railroads were forced to lash together multiple units, complicating operation and dispatching. For Baldwin Locomotive Works, this was a matter of survival. Once the uncrowned king of American steam locomotives, Baldwin was watching its market share slide rapidly in the face of EMD and Alco, companies that understood diesel earlier and moved faster. Baldwin needed a table-flipping breakthrough, not a modest improvement. The Baldwin-Westinghouse alliance therefore carried the character of a strategic gamble. The core idea sounded both simple and convincing. On the drawing board, Baldwin-Westinghouse's gas turbine locomotive appeared to have almost no weaknesses. Instead of a massive diesel engine block with pistons, crankshafts, and thousands of moving parts, Blue Goose used two gas turbines, delivering a combined output of 4,000 horsepower, a figure that surpassed any diesel locomotive running on American rails in the early 1950s. The first advantage was the power-to-weight ratio. Gas turbines were compact, spinning at high speeds and producing large amounts of power without the enormous mass of metal required by piston engines. In theory, this meant stronger tractive effort, smoother acceleration, and less vibration throughout the frame. At the heart of the system was the Brayton cycle. Air compression, continuous combustion, expansion through the turbine. No more thousands of small explosions per minute, like a diesel engine. Instead, there was a steady, almost uninterrupted flow of energy. The turbine drove a generator, and like a diesel-electric locomotive, that electricity was sent to traction motors at the axles. To engineers, this looked like the perfect marriage of aviation technology and railroad electric transmission. Another advantage that caught the attention of financial managers was fuel flexibility. Gas turbines were not picky. From expensive diesel fuel to residual fuel oil, the cheap byproduct left after refining petroleum, all could be burned. In an industry where fuel costs dictated profitability, this was an irresistible invitation. However, there was one fundamental difference that not everyone wanted to confront. Aircraft turbines operate at high altitude, in cold air, 
under stable loads. A railroad turbine, by contrast, must work in dense, hot, high-pressure air at ground level, conditions completely opposite to the ideal environment of aviation turbines. In theory, engineering could address this. In reality, the rails were rarely generous toward beautiful assumptions. Structurally, Blue Goose used a gas turbine electric layout. Two gas turbines drove DC generators and the resulting current was then supplied to traction motors mounted directly on the wheel axles. In principle, this approach was very familiar to the railroad industry, much like a diesel electric, with the only difference being that the source of electrical power was not pistons, but turbines spinning at tens of thousands of revolutions per minute. The size of the machine was anything but small. The body measured 77 feet 10 inches in length, nearly 24 meters, with a weight of up to 494,000 pounds, equivalent to about 224 tons. Even so, thanks to its high power output and smooth electric transmission, Baldwin claimed a maximum speed of 100 miles per hour, an ambitious figure for the early 1950s. One detail that engineers particularly appreciated was the waste heat recovery system. Instead of wasting the hot exhaust from the turbines, Baldwin integrated a steam generator to heat the passenger cars. Compared to the separate oil-fired boilers used on diesel locomotives of the time, this solution was more compact and more energy efficient, at least in theory. As for fuel, Blue Goose was designed to burn residual fuel oil. What remained after lighter fractions, such as gasoline and diesel, had been removed during refining. It was a cheap, abundant fuel, and a key trump card in presentations to the railroads. Low fuel costs, it was argued, could offset any technical risks. The exterior design carried a strong aviation influence. The body was rounded and aerodynamic, with large air intakes running along the sides. Inside was a complex air filtration system, necessary to protect turbine blades from sand, metal particles, and other contaminants found along the rails. Baldwin also equipped the locomotive with an automatic load control system, intended to keep the turbines operating within their most stable range. Seen from the outside, Blue Goose was more than just an experimental locomotive. It looked like a declaration that American railroading could indeed step into a new era, if reality were willing to follow the drawings. When Blue Goose left the Baldwin shops and rolled onto real rails, everything no longer belonged to drawings or laboratories. Baldwin and Westinghouse took locomotive number, 4,000 across major routes, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Chicago, and Northwestern in a carefully prepared series of demonstration runs. This was the decisive moment. Either convince the American railroad industry or watch the dream collapse. The first impressions, to be honest, were positive. At cruising speed, Blue Goose ran with an almost unbelievable smoothness. No vibration, no familiar metallic pounding of pistons. Tractive effort came on evenly and smoothly, with almost none of the surging during acceleration that many diesel locomotives of the era had yet to fully eliminate. To engineers, this was proof that the turbine's continuous rotary motion truly made a difference. But the more it ran, the more problems revealed themselves, and these were not minor flaws that could be corrected with a few bolts or control adjustments. The first issue appeared as soon as the locomotive was asked to do what it would face every day in real service, constantly changing load. Gas turbines do not respond instantly. When the engineer opened the throttle, the compressor had to spool up, combustion pressure had to stabilize, and temperatures had to rise to the proper range. Only then did power increase. This delay, known as throttle lag, is acceptable 
in an aircraft flying steadily at altitude. But for a locomotive, pulling thousands of tons of steel from a standstill, it was a serious drawback. From a thermodynamic standpoint, the gas turbine is efficient only when operating near its designed power level. Railroading, however, lives in the opposite world, starting from rest, stopping, climbing grades, waiting for signals, switching in yards. In those regimes, Blue Goose continued burning fuel simply to keep the compressor spinning, even when very little tractive effort was required. This led to an unavoidable problem, fuel consumption. In theory, the use of cheap residual fuel oil was a strategic advantage. In practice, the amount of fuel burned was so great that it completely erased any price advantage. Worse still, when idling, standing in a yard or waiting for orders, the turbine continued to consume fuel as if it were preparing for takeoff. Then there was noise, not the deep rumble of a diesel, but a high, sharp, continuous shriek, like a jet engine trapped beneath a steel frame. The sound was not merely unpleasant, it made communication near the locomotive almost impossible and raised serious questions about crew working conditions. Operating temperature opened yet another front, with gas temperatures exceeding 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, every cycle of load, increase and decrease produced violent expansion and contraction of metal. Turbine blades, bearings and heat stress components were subjected to levels of thermal stress the railroad environment had never been accustomed to facing. This was not a manufacturing flaw, it was a physical limit. When the demonstration runs came to an end, no catastrophic failures had occurred. Blue Goose did not explode, nor did it die stranded on the rails. But precisely because of that, the conclusion was even colder. Not a single order was signed. The railroads had seen enough, heard enough, and most importantly, they had calculated enough. They understood that operating a locomotive like this would mean entering an entirely different world, a world that required technicians with far higher skill levels than usual, expensive and non-standard parts, longer downtime for every maintenance cycle, and a fuel equation whose costs were always difficult to control. All of that might be acceptable in aviation or power generation, but for railroading, where every hour of downtime meant lost money, it was an unnecessary burden. Meanwhile, diesel electric, though lacking the appearance of the future, was quietly maturing. It responded to the throttle almost instantly, operated efficiently at idle, was easy to maintain, and most importantly, fit the real rhythm of American railroading. Not glamorous, not promising a revolution, but dependable. And so, by 1953, Baldwin made a decisive choice. Locomotive number. 4,000 was dismantled and sold for scrap. The quiet death of Blue Goose was not the end of the gas turbine dream on American rails. At least, not immediately. If Baldwin withdrew in silence elsewhere, that ambition was still being tested. This time, not with a lone prototype, but with an entire fleet. Beginning in 1952, General Electric and Union Pacific Railroad placed a major bet on gas turbine locomotives, not to haul smooth riding passenger trains, but to solve a very specific problem. Pulling ultra heavy freight across the Rocky Mountains, where long grades and steady loads seemed better suited to the turbine's nature. The result was the GTL. Gas Turbine Electric Locomotive Fleet, totaling 55 locomotives, each producing between 4,500 and 8,500 horsepower, unprecedented numbers at the time. For a while, it appeared that gas turbines had found their arena. At steady speeds on long runs, the GTELs delivered impressive pulling power. 
The use of cheap residual fuel oil allowed Union Pacific to temporarily tolerate the high consumption. To many observers, this seemed to prove that Baldwin had not been wrong. Only too early, but reality once again caught up with theory. Enormous fuel consumption, combined with the high sulfur content of residual fuel, began to corrode the systems. Noise and exhaust became serious environmental problems. More importantly, Union Pacific was forced to build separate specialized maintenance facilities with costs that became increasingly hard to justify as diesel electric power continued to improve in output and reliability. By the late 1960s, the verdict was no longer reversible. In 1969 to 1970, Union Pacific retired its entire gas turbine fleet. It was simply the closing of a question that had been answered over two decades. Gas turbines, powerful and modern as they were, could not become the heart of American railroading. And the victory of diesel electric, in hindsight, was anything but accidental. The first reason lay in operational nature. Railroading does not demand continuous peak power. It demands adaptability, starting from rest, pulling heavy loads at low speeds, repeated stopping and starting, then idling for hours in yards. Diesel engines with high torque at low RPM and near instant throttle response were born to live in that environment. Gas turbines were not. They were only truly comfortable when running smoothly, steadily, near full power, a condition rarely found on the rails. The second factor was economic efficiency. Diesel consumed less fuel across most real-world operating modes. More importantly, when not pulling a train, it consumed almost nothing. With turbines, every minute at idle meant fuel burned without creating value. In an industry with thin margins and costs scrutinized down to the gallon, that difference was fatal. Third was the maintenance ecosystem. Diesel Electric One not only because of the engine itself, but because of the entire world built around it. Standardized parts. Mechanics who knew the machines by feel. Clear procedures. And the ability to make quick repairs at small depots. Gas turbines were the opposite. Demanding expensive materials, highly specialized skills, and dedicated facilities that most railroads neither needed nor wanted to invest in. In the end, diesel won because it did not try to become the future. It only tried to be a machine that could be trusted every single day. While gas turbines carried the promise of aviation and power generation, diesel electric quietly proved its worth mile by mile, train by train, always on time. If you've stayed with us through the journey of Blue Goose and the gas turbine era on American rails, take a moment to hit, like if you love real mechanical stories, where engineering, ambition, and reality collide without compromise. Subscribe to the channel if you want to keep digging into the golden age of American engines, from diesel electric power and Detroit V8s to the bold experiments that shaped an entire industry. And if you've ever wondered how many mechanical dreams were left behind along the rails, leave a comment. See you next time.